All right, let's see. I'm going to try to draw this really good picture here. Everyone knows I'm very skilled drawer, if that's the word. What's sad is my dad was a really good drawer, <laughs> like crazy good, but whew, not me. Okay, let's do the body or the barrel, whatever you want to call it. These are not to scale, just so you know. So these are our threads, barrel. We'll do our cap. We're at 3 p.m. now. We're at 3 p.m. All right. All right, everybody. Hello, hello. We'll get back to that in just a sec. Thanks for joining us. Hopefully we will get this going without any hiccups here. So far, so good. Uh, if you're in the chat and you can type, let us know who you are and where you're from. It's good to see everybody. And thanks for joining us again. Today we are making a rollerball section for our custom pen. So uh, we are gonna get into the nitty gritty of that pretty quick here. Uh, if you have any questions during the uh, live stream here, just type them in there. Amy's on the chat for me because I don't have anything in my ears so I can't hear or see. I guess I couldn't hear you anyway because you don't have a mic. But she will let me know your question and I'll do my best to answer it. If I don't know the answer, I will certainly make something up that sounds like a really good answer. So either way, you'll get an answer. But we'll get started here. Okay, look, we got Kevin. Uh-oh, Kevin's hearing me in triple. Clive, welcome in. Yes, pen making is a great hobby and a great therapy thing because you get focused and kind of lose yourself in it. It's really good. Uh, let's see, we got Kim from the UK. Thanks again for coming all the way over. What time is it in the UK, Kim? Uh, we got Mark. Vivian from Peru, that's awesome. Mike Taylor, Roundtown. Hey Mike, is this the first live stream you've made it to? It's funny because Mike's local, so I get to see him all the time, but it's cool that he made it on this live stream. Uh, if you want to see some really cool segmenting, check out Mike's Instagram page. What is it, Roundtown with Mike or just Roundtown? Roundtown. Mike, put you a link to your Instagram so they can see your segmenting work. Good stuff. All right. Let's see. Cleared up now. Sounds like a Kevin problem to me, Kevin. All right. San Diego. Cool. We got Rick. Awesome. All right. Let's get started. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to my notebook cam uh, so you guys can see what we're talking about here. There's going to be some, uh, some figuring out and some technicalness here, but nothing very hard. Okay. So what we've got here, and let me know, Amy, if you can't see it at all. Uh, this is our ink refill. This is our cap, and this is our barrel. So cap, barrel, ink refill. I mean, they're, those pictures, you probably knew exactly what they were. They're identical. And we're going to be making a section to mimic this to go into the barrel to house the roller ball. So uh, what we want it to look like, let's see here. I'll draw some threads and we'll go like this and like I said this is not to scale and it won't look anything like it but we're gonna have our threads here which are these threads and then we're gonna have a series of drill holes in this and that will be for the ink refill here the roller ball now, a couple things about a rollerball. Uh, rollerballs have a spring. It's at the back. So when you have your rollerball loaded up, it's like this. And that cool, smooth feeling you get when you write the little bit of compression is that spring at the back. So whenever we're figuring stuff out, we want to make sure that spring is in there and it's set properly so we can get that little bit of bounce. So that's what we want there. Now, we want to essentially mimic this because of our lengths. So if I take this out, you can see that my rollerball refill with spring, if I line up the tips here of the nib and the tip of the rollerball, they're fairly close. And actually once it's under compression, they're gonna be almost the same. 
So what that means to me is I can make a section for my roller ball that's the same length from the shoulder on the back of the tenon threads here to the tip of the nib and it'll work just fine because I'm going to compress this a little bit inside. So I'm going to start off with a series of measurements here to get what I want and what I need to make. So let's do, well, we got this here. Let's measure this. So get yourself a good set of calipers. They don't have to be expensive, just good. And measure. And these are all going to be kind of approximates. Uh, looks like 40, 6.5 so that's from this shoulder to the tip is 46.5 and keep in mind you can write these measurements down i'll show you this picture at the end if you want but um, really it's going to depend on how you made the rest of your pen so these measurements might might not work for everything because you might have a different measurement now this is the pen we made in the last few videos or a few live streams. So if you've been following along and keeping track, this is the same pen. Now I wanna have uh, like eight millimeters of threads for the tenon. So I'm gonna tack that on here, so eight. So we will call that 55. So my overall length will be 55. Now I've got a blank cut here, let's see what it is. Oh, actually that's good, it's 58. So that gives me a little extra room to work with and you'll see why we need that uh, as we get along, but that's actually a good thing to do, to have a little extra. So 55 is my finish length. I certainly don't wanna start with 55 and trim off, but that gives me three and a half millimeters, 3.4 approximately to work with. Now, what we also need to measure is uh, the refill. Once you've done this, you probably can keep the measurements and you'll know everything for the next time, make it a lot easier. So the refill is 110 millimeters long, 110, see if that's blocking here. The front section here, let's see, first shoulder to tip, 20. So that's this shoulder here to the tip is 20. The small shoulder is approximately five. That's this guy, five, whoop. Forgot I have a pencil, not a pen. And then the little thin part from the shoulder to the tip is about 15. So here to the tip, 15. Now those are our, those, the reason we're measuring that is because that's going to be our drilling once we figure this out. We also need to know how big to drill. So the body here, let's see, can you guys see that? Even though it's upside down, about 6.1, 6. The first step, 4.37, which I'm going to call 5. And the last one, 2.49, I'm gonna call it 2.5. And the reason I'm rounding is I want this to go in there but not be tight or stick. I want it to move freely but still be, you know, close and guided. So if we're going to use this uh, section as our guide, we can now figure out how deep we're going to drill into these. So our overall length is 55. We want 15, 15 from the tip to the shoulder, but we don't want that. Actually, you know what? We don't need to figure that because we got a longer piece. So we'll trim that down as we go. So that's actually okay. Wait a minute. That's that one. 15. Okay, so we're 55 here. We're gonna measure our first one. Now we're gonna use, uh, instead of a 6.6, .6, I or 6.1, which I don't have, we're gonna use the 930 seconds drill. The 930 seconds is what we drilled through for the uh, 
all the way through the section. If you remember, we used the four drill bits. They happen to be right here. The 930 seconds was our first of the four. So we're gonna use that as our first bit. But keep in mind, you're not gonna drill all the way through because this one has to have a little tiny hole that's all the way through. Oh, okay. Is it like not focusing correctly? Or not quite? Okay. Amy said, I'm moving too fast and the camera's not keeping up. So I'm gonna slow down here a little bit. So we, we basically have to drill three holes. Our 930 seconds, we're going to drill from the end of our 50 millimeters. Actually, it's gonna be, let's see. We wanna subtract our two pieces here. So 15 and five millimeters. So we're gonna do 35 millimeters in. Then our second one will include the five millimeter step here. So we'll go 40. Boy, I'm pushing too hard on that pencil. And that will be our five millimeter drill. And then our last one will be our two and a half millimeter drill. And it's gonna go all the way through. Now, um, Let's see. This, hopefully this makes sense. So what we're creating is when this pushes up in here, it'll have this little stop there and this will proceed through the end. And then when you write, it'll push back on it. And that's what gives you the pressure and the nice smooth rollerball writing. So we're like, much like we mimic the nib, inside of the section, we're gonna mimic the drilling inside of this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is do the drilling. Then I'm gonna cut the tenon and thread the tenon, and then we'll shape it. So it's, uh, it's just some steps kind of like before, but nothing earth shattering, but it can be a little tricky. So let's, let's walk through it. Now, what we're gonna be using on this is very similar to before to the things before. We're gonna use a collet chuck and some different collets. I'm going to be using my, let's see here. If you guys have heard me talk about the Record Live Center, the Falcon, I'm gonna use the Falcon Live Center because it has interchangeable tips. So I'm gonna use this long tip uh, you can use the 60 degree cone. It comes with a pen mandrel, but I'm gonna use this long tip. We will be using the niche system again with the die holder and our M10 die. And let's see, what am I missing? Of course, we will use a mandrel, which we'll talk about that when we get to there, to that. And I'm actually gonna use a four jaw chuck. This is an SC3. Uh, with the little pin jaws on it. And I'm gonna use this to hold my mandrel because I don't have a collet chuck that will work for that. But we'll get to that in a sec. A we got a question, go ahead. A couple of people are curious, why would you not start with the small bit as a pilot and then work your way up? Uh, that's a good question. So the, the question is, why would you not start with a small bit as the pilot and then step your way up? You certainly could, and there wouldn't be any reason you wouldn't. The reason I do it the other way is I tend to screw up the bigger bits when I do it. So if I do those first and it all goes well, um, then I'm going to keep proceeding. Plus, it leaves me that center point with each big bit ends with a center point because of the taper of the bit. And that kind of is my starter for my smaller hole. So totally makes sense to drill the pilot hole in most cases. For this, I just like to do it the other way, but honestly, do it whichever way you want. And you'll see when we get on here um, that you could do it either way, for sure. Good, good question. Totally makes sense logically, because you would usually drill the small hole first as a pilot. But I'm gonna kind of have the bit extended too, and I don't want it to walk on me. So by using the stouter bits first, I think it's 
better for me to get like a more solid hole, more, more consistent hole. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. <laughs> so, all right. Let's chuck this up. So I put the collet chuck on here. I'm going to put my, my blank in. Now, I'm pretty sure this is square. We'll look here to be sure. Let's see. I need to zoom that a little more. What do you guys think? Too much? All right. So this, this should be square, but I'm going to kind of just eyeball it. Eh, it looks pretty good. So the first thing I'm going to do is center drill my, my two ends. And because the one end is going to be that little tiny drill bit, I don't want to overdo it and center drill it too much because I'm using kind of a larger center drill. This is a number three. If I had a number one nearby me, I'd probably grab that instead. Which there you go. If you use a number one, you could easily do your small hole all the way through. So I'm going to use this guy. And like most of this stuff, if you've watched the others in this series, there's certainly more than one way to do almost all of these steps I show you. So do the one that works the best for you. And I'm just going to touch that end. This will be our tip end. And now this will be our tenon end. So once we're locked in here, now this end is going to get that bigger drill bit. So I can drill this center drill in a little further and not worry about it. And by the way, uh, Great question, and anyone is allowed to ask questions except for Kevin. He's on the no question list. All right, so that's just our pilot hole, our, our center drill, exactly. Now we're gonna drill this first hole, our 930 seconds. And I want to drill it I think, so my, the end of my flute is about the right length here, maybe just a hair. So I'm gonna go and use that for my eyeball here. But I like to get it up close, lock it down. Um, I do snug my, my lock here, but not tight. I just get it to keep my drill in the right direction. Let me get my tool rest out of the way. And I do clear this a couple of times because I don't want that resin getting hot, which it's gonna get hot real quick, um, but I don't wanna overheat it in there and kind of melt it and create a problem. So I'll clear my drill a couple times. Now, quick tip, if you're gonna move your drill into the piece, turn off the lathe, because if you move your drill in and you hit the back where you haven't drilled, it's gonna suck your drill in if you have any kind of pressure and it's gonna add a control drill. So if you stop it, you can stop it here, lock it down, and then back it up a tiny bit so it's not making contact, and then you can turn on your lathe. And it's just much smoother. If you do it the other way and you you jam it in there, you can get away with it a few times, but eventually you will catch that drill bit and ruin your, your piece if you drill too far. So you see how tight that was, it kind of popped out. Okay, so that's our 930 second for, what did I say, 35 mil? I forget. Okay. Oh, that was 35. This is our five millimeter. I think this bit measured like 5.3, which is the closest thing I had. Um, you can use anything you have, of course. This is actually a, a 3 16 bit. So I don't know what that converts to, but it worked pretty well. 
So that's what I'm going to use. So I'm going to get it in here and put it up to where it touches. I'll back it off a little bit. Oh, and then I need to make sure I drill this. This is only going five millimeters further. So let's see. Five mil, 40 right there. Looks like I had an old line on here already. I'm just gonna mark it for 40. So this is that first shoulder of the ink refill. So I'm gonna touch it. Now you can see my line there. I'm only going five more millimeters than the last one. So not a lot of drilling. That's it. I think most of that was already in the, the blank. All right, and then lastly, we're gonna through drill with our two and a half mil. And this drill bit, I don't know if it has a size on it. Oh, it actually does. Is a 7 64ths. And that is the closest thing I had to two and a half millimeters, which, let me see how close that is. It doesn't sound very close. Uh, 2.7, 2.6 something. 2.68 which is actually fine because it gives us that little bit of extra. All right. And you see what I'm doing? I'm just putting it in the hole and then making sure it finds center, turning it on. And now with this one we're gonna drill through so I don't have to measure anything here. I'll pull it out, make sure it's all the way through. I think it is. All right. And we can now check this out, make sure it's through. Look at that. It's like right touching. Nope, that's the wrong one. <coughs> I need to extend that bit just a tiny bit. Just to get through. There, that should do it. That must have been my uh, pilot hole. I thought that was through. All right. Do we put everybody to sleep yet? Are we okay? All right. 45 people watching. Good stuff. Hopefully you guys have been trying the, uh, the pens from the last few videos. Anybody make one yet? Actually, if you did, you should send pictures to Amy. We'd love to see them and she'll share them on the Turner's page. It's kind of fun. And it's cool because even though these are all kind of the same, made the same way, they look very different. All right, we got a hole through. Good. So now I'm gonna put my refill in and I wanna just make sure everything lines up. I should be able to see the tip of my refill sticking out or sticking in there, but it won't be sticking out because remember this is a few millimeters longer, which is good. Um, when we go to turn it, we're gonna need those extra millimeters. So I don't think the camera will pick it up, maybe, but you can see the tip of the refill, probably one or two millimeters inside of there, which is actually quite good. So it worked pretty well. It feels snug without being super tight or super loose. It would be nice to throw this in the cleaner. We can do that at the end. Uh, I'm not gonna do it on the live stream, obviously, because even more boring than sanding something on the live stream would be ultrasonic cleaning something on the live stream. We can do that as a separate video all on its own. But now we're ready to put the tenon on this. So I'm gonna put it back in the chuck and I'm gonna mark out the tenon. Now I estimated eight millimeters for the tenon. So I'm gonna lock this at eight approximately. Whoa, that's awful close. Oh no, I didn't save enough room. Let's see if I can do it. All right. Uh, 
That should work. And I'm going to try to put my line just on the side of it so that I can cut up to it. So I won't want to cut away my line here, but I want to cut right up to it. Everything good, Amy? Oh no. Okay, so we're hearing that it's a little choppy. Okay. Well, I'm going to just keep rolling, guys. Hopefully, it'll correct. Um, just so you know, if not, we'll, uh, you know, we'll repost this as needed and whatever it takes. So you'll get this information, but hopefully, you can bear with us and it'll clean up a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and cut my tendon now. Something that's of interest to me uh, and probably to you is it'd be nice to use the tenon cutter here. However, if you remember from the last video, the tenon cutter uses a long pilot and it's a six millimeter shaft that goes through. So to cut the, to cut the tenon with the pilot, you'd have to drill it through. I wonder if I could cut the tenon without the pilot. I think I could. Is it worth trying live? Yeah, let's try it. So normally I cut them by hand, but it'd be much nicer to cut it with it. So what I'm going to do is set up the tenon cutter. This will be the first time I've done it without the shaft. Let's set up the tenon cutter and then take the shaft out and just use it as like a boring head style. So let's grab it. Normally I just use the tenon cutter setup bushing to uh, measure off of, but Oh, that's not it. It would be nice to just use the tenon cutter without the shaft. And probably if I was going to do this very often, I would just make a short shaft for it as well. So I could use it with it. Okay, get back. Oh, it's being cranky. All right, get that up there. <laughs> so if you haven't seen the tenon cutter before, it's a great tool. Old Jim Hines from Hines Custom Pens made it and uh, or invented it and we make it for him now. So you can get it here or there. But you use the setup bushing to line up the cutter head here. Lock down these Allens for the setup and then just check to make sure that there's no gap. So you want this lined up and straight without being super tight on it. And then we can load it right into the machine. All right, so I think that's gonna work. Now I'm just gonna take away my shaft and use the tenon cutter like that. So, I don't see why this wouldn't work. If anyone has any thoughts, let me know. But <clears throat> I mean, the, the head of the tenon cutter is locked into the drill chuck and the cutter itself is locked into the tenon cutter head. So I don't, I don't see why it wouldn't work and actually might work really well. And we're only cutting a very short tenon, eight millimeters. So I think it'll be pretty cool. I'm gonna put my safety glasses on, of course. Now, get this up close, lock everything down, and then, you know, don't lock your, your lock here, but kind of snug it so you don't have any side-to-side -side movement. And then we're just gonna gently introduce this cutter into the thing. So let's see how she works. I don't see any movement. I want to hold on to this drill chuck because I don't want it to spin on me. Get those out of there. Ah, it feels great. So as long as my tenon is the proper size, I'm good. All right. What you got?
Well, that's a good question. John asked how accurate is a wood lathe compared to a metal lathe. In comparison, probably not accurate at all. Um, however, you know, there's a lot of great stuff you can do on a wood lathe. And just through this video series, I've been making more than on the lives, uh, just playing with it. Cause I primarily made everything I made custom on the metal lathe. And I actually really like the wood lathe cause it's a lot more versatile and easy. Whereas the metal lathe is super rigid. Like you can only do this movement or that movement or whatever, but the wood lathe you're controlling your tooling and all that. So I kind of like the wood lathe. A lot of people have told me since we started this that even if they use a metal lathe, they shape on the wood lathe, which I never did. I always shaped on the metal lathe and it was a real pain. So, um, so accuracy, wood lathe not, probably can't even compare because of precision, although the lathes nowadays are pretty good. But you can make stunning pens and most of the custom people you see out there, I, I don't know most of them, but a lot of them are on wood lathes and they make really precise stuff. So um, <clears throat> if you're looking for precision, I may not be your guy, but you can take what I'm teaching in these live streams and precise it up to your own level of you know, exact measurements. Some people measure every part and that's cool. Um, I'm more of a fly by what looks good at the time. So yeah, good question, but not really something I can answer other than the fact that you know, it's not as precise, but it works really well. So give it a try and actually see what you, what you think. So next I'm going to just do a little quick sand on this tenon. And all I'm doing is making sure it's nice and smooth. And I want to make sure I don't have any little cut marks from the, the cutter. I am wet sanding it. I wet sand everything, which if you've watched the other videos or any videos, you've heard me say it a million times and I am kind of giving it a little taper on the end here. You could do this with a tool or a file, but since I've got some sandpaper here, this should be enough, but I just want a nice smooth tenon before I cut my threads. I think it makes for better threads personally may not make a real difference, but if you think it does, you should do it. All right. Uh, the question is why couldn't or wouldn't you use a skew? Uh, you absolutely could. The reason I didn't is um, because I wanted to try the tenon cutter without the, the pilot. But you would just have to measure. So you would cut, measure, cut, measure, and that's fine. Uh, that's how I've always done it. But I thought of trying that. And it seemed to work pretty well. It looks like we're at 10.8, which is actually a little big. But I, oh wait. Hard to get a measurement on here. Yeah, well, we'll see how it, how it did. Um, but yeah, you could certainly use a skew. I typically use a skew or a, a parting tool, like a square parting tool, because then you can make that nice straight cut and it works really well. So use whatever you want, as long as it works, it's all that matters. All right. So I'm going to grab the niche system with the tenon or with the, yeah, the tenon die in it. This is my M10 threads for the body. And it'll be curious to see if this, cause that tenon cutter, I've not had any threads or any tenons the wrong size. Um, so if this is too big, it'll be interesting that I did it without the, pi the pilot shaft. So I sprayed a little WD-40 on there. You don't have to, but I like to because it just gives the tap a little um, lubrication. All right, so we're gonna push this on and we're gonna push forward as we rotate it. And you'll see those little curly cues coming off of here. That's what you want. And you can clear them. If you go forward and then back up, Usually that'll cut them loose. And I like to try to clear them as I go because I don't want them getting between the die and the shoulder when I get to the end here. So I'm gonna back it up and try to clear some of those out. 
and then go all the way up to the shoulder. Now, we can unthread this or back it off, whatever you want to call it. Oh, you know what I did? I actually, well, so normally I would start my threads with the writing on the die first, which is a little easier to get started. And then I would flip it around so I could get up a little closer to the shoulder, but I didn't notice that I was already backwards. So I should be okay here as far as that goes. I'm gonna take my wet sandpaper and just kind of knock the tops of these threads off. And let's test this. Okay. So I kind of went backwards there, but it looks like it'll work. Yeah. A little tight up against the shoulder there because I got a little bit of a ramp. What I can do is bring in my diamond tool and just kind of clean that up, or I could use sandpaper. Now you want to be real, real careful not to take off too much. That should be good. And what I'm doing is uh, when I do that is the threads as they approach the shoulder kind of have ramped and it pushes that material out and it ramps up. So by cutting that just relieves the back there. So it should match up to the barrel a little better. Let's take a look. And you want to be careful doing this with, with stuff. Cause like some of this is dirty. That looks really good. Um, you know, dust and debris. So you don't want to like get crap in your threads when you're trying to thread these on and off, but that worked pretty well. And it looks like I ended up with more than eight millimeters, even though I measured it. Let's see. No, 8.1. I guess we'll call that a win. Okay. Very good. We're moving right along here. What's the chatter? Any, anything else going on? Yeah, those guys love the ornament contest. He's probably out making an ornament is why he left. <laughs> All right, so, like I said, I know there's probably some chatter in there. You can do this a bunch of different ways. So do you do you, this is just one way to do it. Let's run over here and talk about the mandrel. So if you've watched the other videos in this series, you probably remember me showing this mandrel for the section that threads in this way. And I stated before, I don't like doing that. You put a live center up here. Um, I personally feel like I break more that way. Now, that being said, I was doing it on the metal lathe. So maybe on the wood lathe, it wouldn't be as fragile, but, um, there is a purpose to this and there's a reason I have it and it's for doing these rollerball sections. So we're going to put this on here. We're going to put this in the chuck and then we've got a hole here or through hole for the live center. Now I'm going to use this one because I like this narrow blunt tip, but this will push into my material quite a bit and it'll kind of hollow me out. So I'm going to have to bring this tip down not only to our proper length for the refill, but also to clear out the, the hole that this pushes in. Because when we have this spinning and this rubbing against it, it's going to create heat and it's going to wallow out that hole a little more, even if we try to keep on top of it. So you want to keep it snug without over tightening it. Um, but we're going to now shape this and that's how we're going to hold it to shape it. Yeah, you can do, 
you can do the 10 in so many different ways. Pretty much any tool that's got an edge. Uh, yeah, like Amy was saying, I, I used the parting tool this morning. Um, I've used the diamond tool to cut a tenon. I've used my square carbide. And you know, if you're gonna repeat this, I'm just sanding this a little bit, that shoulder. Uh, if you're gonna repeat this, you could make a little gauge that you could cut the tenon and slip over it to make sure you're at the right size rather than trying to set your calipers every time. Um, so if it's something you're gonna repeat, make yourself a little jig and that'll help, help hold it in place. Okay, now, I don't know why, but I don't have a collet that fits this mandrel. I probably didn't make it to fit a collet because it typically would go in a chuck. So I'm gonna use this four jaw chuck. And this is just an SC3 record power chuck. It's got these pin jaws on it. Um, they're nice if you're doing headstock thread stuff for the outside here, but it holds chuck or holds mandrels really nice. And it's a precision truck, so I don't have to worry about it being off center or anything. Now, I like to bring this up and kind of slowly introduce that tip into the, the hole there. Because if I jam it in there and it's too tight, when I go to turn this on, all that pressure is on that tenon right inside of there. So I don't want to have it, you know, jerk it to where it could snap that tenon. And it's a good test because obviously, it's gonna to have to handle people screwing it in and out of the barrel, but I don't wanna do any extra that I don't have to. So this is loose, but it's up there to the hole. And now I can turn it on. I'll get close here. And once we get up to speed, we can snug this up. So it's really burying in there already. I can already see white from it. Um, it's really getting in there. Now I am going to pull my cam back up to catch some of this dust and debris. So there will be a little cam noise. Now I know that this step here is a little smaller than wh what I want for the barrel, this part here. So I'm going to turn it just, just outside of that, kind of give it a rough shape. Then I'll take it off and test it and see how much more we need to take down on it. This is probably gonna be out of round because this is just a, a straight blank that was never rounded. So I need to get it round first. And you can see my live center slowing down as it gets wrapped with that's the live center spinning in there. So I want to snug it up a little more and then I'll keep turning. But I want to keep an eye on that because I need to snug it as it loosens up on me. What's that? Hey, Zach Higgins is in the chat. Hey, Zach. All right, now this is a good opportunity to use your calipers. So this is an M14 thread, so it's approximately M14. I'm still quite a bit larger. I'm at 15 and a half. So I'm gonna bring it down just a little more. And you can see I'm not using my fingers to move the shavings because this chuck is a little more, a little more, uh, bitey than my collet chuck. So I gotta be a little more careful. Now I'm gonna give a little kind of finger impression here. I like a little, I don't know if the right word is uh, recess maybe. Ooh, that looks like a lot. I might've done that too much, <clears throat> but that's okay. Let's measure this. I'm 
trying to hold this where you guys can see it, but it's hard to accurately do that. We're still a little big, just barely. So I'm just gonna bring this down a tiny bit. And I know I gotta bring this down quite a bit. So that noise is my live center squeaking in the material. Not ideal. And you're gonna see, I'm gonna cut this tip a little long because I'm gonna be bringing it back. Because remember, I got a little extra material and I've got a little bit too long of a, a front there. So my ink refill is not gonna stick out till I cut that down. All right, this is a good point. Let's, um, let's test fit this and see what adjustments we need to make. I'm just going to unscrew it here. Just sticking. Just, I'm just spraying a little WD-40 to clean it off. But let's see here. This is going to look good. You can see I'm a little big. Oh, maybe you can. I need to probably bring off like maybe half a millimeter and then see that hole. That's from the, the live center really pushing in there. Now the beauty is we've got that extra room. Oh, oh, we got it right here. So when I push that through, you can see my tip is just now, well, you can see my tip is just now coming out of the hole. So I got quite a bit of room. Let's get a ballpark. I can probably remove three and a half to four millimeters off that tip, but I don't want to do that until the very end because I'm still using that for support to shape the rest of this. And I like the way it's starting to look. I want that, that finger grip part like that for when it's on the pen. All right, let's take it down a little more. All right, just be real careful putting this back up here. You don't want to hit your piece. There we go. All right, so I needed to take off just a little bit here. That should be enough. And I'm gonna be taking off that three and a half. So that means my tip will be kind of behind the caliper arm here. So I'm gonna move this back a little bit. I'm gonna go ahead and cut that away. It'll be easier when I go to remove it. Oh, that thing's screaming. Give it a little more taper. And it looks funny now, but it should be good once we're, once we're lined up. All right, I turned off the, the air, or the dust collector. Can anyone hear the difference? I don't know how loud it is on camera. Okay, so we're gonna test fit this again. And I, I mean, you gotta test fit this, but boy, I hate threading resin threads into metal. It just feels like you can mess it up so easily. Okay, that looks good as far as our shape. I like that, that's gonna look really cool. I'll have to clean that one. 
And then we can take one more look here. Yep, so we just need to kind of square this off. So this is, uh, I'm happy with the shape. If I wasn't, I wouldn't do the end yet, but I'm happy with the shape. So now I'm gonna take off the tip and what I want to do is I'm going to use my flat carbide and I'm going to bring it back. And the whole, the whole reason I'm doing that is I want to push against the chuck. I want to push towards the chuck and not across the material. If I tried to cut across the material, you know, it's sticking way out here. I'm going to bend it or flex it. Um, but here you can see it probably a little easier. So I'm going to just use the side of my tool carefully and I'm going to reduce that down and I want to look at it and see how far whoa you saw it jump there I was getting a little too aggressive okay so now I'm going to test it and we probably need to come down a tiny bit more but I'd rather sneak up on it than go too far and maybe we'll get lucky Okay, we got quite a bit more still. Unless there's something in there. I feel like we were closer before. <laughs> okay, we got quite a bit more to take off. I swear that was, maybe I was off in my measurement there. See, I get into trouble when I try to measure. Okay, so I'm just gonna continue to push into this and reduce it very carefully. And you know, honestly, maybe I was not near as far as I thought I was um, when I cut that last one. But this is just some of the, the trial and error. You could try to make it the right size right from the start, which would be fine and dandy, except for the fact that you're going to lose material from your live center. Okay, so it looks like we probably want it to stick out just to that break. So maybe another half mil, mil. All right. This is the fun of working it out. And it is trying to walk like crazy on me. Okay. Now I'm going to try to get a little cut here. And I'm going to support it with my finger as best I can. And you can see I tried to... Uh, I tried to shape this a little more, but I cut off some of the tips. So it's a little more awkward than I would have wanted, but I think it's gonna look fine once we sand it and shape it. Let's see here. All right. Looks good. Let me put the spring and the refill in. We'll kind of give it a full test fit here. Yeah, so the question was about the mandrel. Um, yeah, that's sticking out pretty good. Um, we don't have them on the website yet. We will add them probably next week. Uh, but if you have an M10, M, M10 tap for making your bodies, you can make that and you can make it out of Durlin. You could, heck, you could probably make it out of just a blank because really all you're going to do is drill it and tap it so that you can thread it in and hold it. It's nothing fancy. It's really basic. So um, that'd be one I would encourage people to try and make because it's very simple. But if you don't want to make one down the road, we should have them. All right. So that fit, I showed that, but I was, I was talking about something else. That fit pretty well. So I think what we're going to do is give it a little shaping. 
Now, obviously you could shape with uh, a little more aggressive sandpaper if you wanted to. I'm gonna use 400. And the reason I'm gonna use 400 is it won't scratch my stuff, but it'll, it'll give me a little bit of movement. So let's slow this thing way, way down. We're, we're at 3,000. Okay, there we go. So it's best to do all the shaping you can with the tools because sanding to shape is a lot more time consuming and boring. Uh, but once you lose that tail stock on something like this that's sticking out, it's really hard to do any shaping with your tool. So I'd rather shape it a little bit with my sandpaper than risk busting it off with my tool once I get to that point. But if you can kind of think ahead and work work ahead for yourself, you'll get a lot further. Now, the only thing I don't like about this thing that we've done here is this tip is a little on there, thin enough, but you all will at least see how it will look. So you can shape it however you want. If you like it like this, then you'd be in hog heaven, but uh, I would prefer it a little more pointy. But I actually don't mind it because sometimes it looks cool, more blunt looks more custom anyway. And I'm just using this 400 to kind of get all the tool marks out and give myself a little bit of shape rounding here at the front, just trying to bring it down a little bit. And this blank is gonna look killer. The, um, I probably mentioned it before as we were turning and shaping this. This is our molten metal blank. It's a top choice blank at Turner's and it's super cool. It looks like molten metals. So it's a little more blunt here than I would like. I'd probably like it a little more tapered, but I'm not gonna risk um, the piece for that. So I'm gonna use Zona paper. If you watch the other videos, you know what Zona paper is. It's just polishing paper. It's uh, made by 3M. It comes in eight and a half by 11 sheets that you cut to what you want. And I like it because it's six pieces instead of nine. It'll work just fine. Amy, were you about to say something? I'll try to hold this to where you guys can see. Uh, I hear that our video is getting a little choppy. I do apologize. I don't know what is going on. Hopefully we can hang in there to the end. Yeah, so this is an M10 thread. It's M10 by one, which you can use other, other thread sizes and pitches. This is the one that most people choose. This is the one we offer. Um, so whatever you use for your, your body, your section to go into your barrel, whether it be a rollerball or a fountain section, that's what you would make your mandrel. So it just mimics the body instead of in external, it's an internal thread. Now the zona, you just need about 35 to 45 seconds with each grit. The first grit is, a, is like 800, even though it doesn't remove a lot of material, it's like 800. And then the final grit is one micron, which is like 20,000 or 24,000, something high. But it does a really good job. And I'll use this for four or five parts or pens if I'm doing kit pens, and then I'll switch it because I it kind of starts to wear. But that's what I like about it is you can switch it and you still have a whole sheet of it. Like I said, eight and a half by 11 uh, that you cut off of. So you get kind of fresh paper all the time. Whereas on my micro mesh, I don't change the pads often. And so you kind of use the same ones over and over. Yeah, so this is an M10 thread, but you can also do sections with anything you want. Uh, there's some people do M9, so they can make a little slimmer pen, or M11 if they're doing a big, big pen. But use whatever you want for size. And I just like to rinse this often. I think the wet does a better job of keeping it shiny when it's done. Could just be a theory, but it seems to work. Uh, 
Did anybody say, has anyone tried it since they watched the series? I know I asked that earlier, but I, didn't, I never heard. Has, Yeah, you know, um, Amy said you guys are talking about the wood lathe versus metal lathe, but I totally agree. I would have thought you would need, like, you know, the precise movements of the, the wood lathe or the metal lathe. <clears throat> but as you can see, I'm using a wood chuck right now with, you know, a homemade mandrel, and I'm making this section. And is it perfectly perfect? Absolutely not, but it's pretty dang good. Um, so really just do the best you can. I always tell people, sometimes people walk into our store and they'll have the most beautiful. Oh, that's a big question. So I'm just going to dry this off here gently. Look at that thing. So the question is, are there any standards, uh, for fountain pens? And it's kind of a yes, no answer. Um, most custom makers use these ones we've been talking about. So for the section and the inside the body, uh, most people use an M10 by one. You can use an M9, you can use an M10 by 0.75, it's a little finer. Uh, there is no standards as far as all the world because every company uses whatever they want. Now, I'll tell you M10 is the most popular. As far as the cap and body threads, M13 is the most popular for that. There is 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 that are available, but 13 is by far the most popular size that I have seen. So as far as a custom maker's standards, like our community, I would say M10 by one for the body inside, and M13 for the cap and body is probably your, your standards. So I'm gonna go ahead and put a little dot of uh, ring bling here. It's just a cleaner polisher. And you don't have to use this, but you could use uh, any plastics polish that you like, just to give it a little extra shine. Just dry it off there and it should be good. Now, that being said, if you want to stand out and be different, you could certainly use something no one else does. But it is kind of nice, um, if you get going on this, most of the makers, I'll say most of the the custom makers are very friendly and willing to help. Um, and if you have sizes that are similar to what they're using, it might be easier to get help down the road or um, you could make a repair for someone if it's something you use that someone else uses. So it's kind of nice to have uh, kind of similar sizes, but you know, like I said, you can do any size you want. Okay, take a look at this. This thing looks pretty. Cool. So the only purple start happens is the cap and body, and then the section would be a single start. Yeah. So the question is, uh, the cap and body are triple start, and the section is single start. Generally, that is 100% correct. Most people use a single start for this one, the tenon for inside the barrel, and a triple lead for the cap and body. Now, the reason we use a triple lead is it makes it easy to thread the cap. You know, when you're putting it on, you basically put it on, it starts turning, right? Like I didn't have to search for it. You can certainly use a single lead on the cap and body, but what will happen is sometimes you'll put the cap on and it'll spin for a sec, and then it'll start to catch the threads. And it's just looking for that starting point, and it just has one instead of three. Uh, some guys who do custom work will do a four start on their metal lathe. That's above my head, so I've seen it done, but I can't do it. So I use tap and die, <laughs> but nothing wrong with e any one of them. If you got a M or if you got a 13 single start and you want to use it by all means. Now, this is kind of getting into the weeds, but having three start positions means you have three end positions, right? So if you're lining up grain or something in the cap and body with a triple lead, like most of us use, you're only going to be on that thing one out of three times. So you might have to back it up rotate it, start it again, and to get it lined up. Whereas a single lead, it would, it would be lined up every time if you lined it up to begin with. So that's kind of an interesting thing. 
Uh, some of the guys who paint blanks or do designs on them use a single lead for that reason. So good question, a lot of stuff on this. And if you didn't watch those other videos, uh, feel free to go check them out because it might explain the, the taps and dies a little more, but it's really very versatile. And you don't have to use metric, you can use something else, but you're gonna have to make all the mandrels because for, from what I know and what we offer, everything's metric. So, all right, let's take a look at this thing up close. So there is our section. Looks pretty cool. Now this is a different cut of the blank. So it looks a little more silver, but I kind of dig it. It looks fine to me. I didn't think the point was good. It's a little more rounded here than I would like, but I actually don't think it looks bad. I'll do a test. Works. So success. Um, you know, obviously you want to make sure that the cap closes right. Now I did do this section, uh, a section out of this same material before. Let's look, so this is the one we just made. So look how different, a different, same, came from the same blank, but look how much different it looks, more coppery. So you can do, you know, make a couple of different sections out of different things. And that one's even more blunt, but really it's just what you want. You got a question? Yeah. And then um, David said that he started one and got sidetracked and then is using some random blanks to make the parts so it'll be like a Frankenstein. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, he said, somebody said they're using random blanks to make parts. Totally do that. Sorry, there's a tow truck out back if you can hear it. Uh, one is just practice. So use, if you got chunks of blanks left over from something else, make a section out of it, make a cap out of it, whatever you can. One, it'll give you practice, and then two, you can put all those Franken blanks together, and sometimes they look super cool. And I break a lot of sections, so I've said this before, I generally make like a bunch of black sections just to have laying around, because I always break sections for some reason. I'll drop them or crack them doing something. And so I just throw a black in there, and it always seems to work well with most colors. So practice, practice, practice. If you make a few of these, and especially in a short time, if you make a few, they get so easy. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> what brand of metal lathe would I recommend? Um, here's my opinion, and this comes from learning from other guys that are experts in metal lathes. Um, so I have a Precision Matthews uh, modern lathe. I bought it, I think, maybe 10 years ago, maybe eight, nine, I don't know. Um, it was relatively expensive. I think it was three or 4,000 bucks but I wanted to have it for this. Since then, I have gotten a 1940-something South Bend off Craigslist, and I love it. I actually want to get rid of my Precision Matthews and get another old lathe. So I would say if I was going to be looking right now for a metal lathe, I would not buy a new one, although there are some good choices out there, but I would look for a quality used lathe from way back. Uh, South Bend, Logan, even the old Craftsman. Um, there's others that I can't think of right now. You can get them for a steal. And I can give you a prime example because I just watched one end at a local auction today. It was a Logan on the stand, beautiful lathe. If I'd had the time or room, I would have certainly bought it or bid on it. It sold for $900. I had talked to Jim Hines about it. He said the lathe is probably worth five grand. And I don't doubt it. But I just didn't have the time to deal with it or the place to put it at this moment. Uh, but I will certainly be looking for something like that to replace my Precision Matthews with because I like the old quality. It seems so much better. Um, they were just made so, so well. And you can still get parts. There's huge groups out there. But I, I don't go blindly buy a metal lathe off Craigslist because there's a lot of junk too. Get to know somebody who knows it. I'm happy to answer any questions, although I'm very much not an expert. But there's guys like Jim around who are generally pretty happy to talk to you about it and answer questions. But find somebody local that is into that and you'll learn so much. But if I was gonna recommend a metal lathe, I'd look for an old one. Maybe right, maybe wrong. It's weird, old wood lathes were not near as precise as they are now, but old metal lathes seem to be better than they are now. 
And I'm sure that comes with cost. If you spent 20 grand on a new modern lathe that was really good quality, I'm sure it'd be fine. But um, for like the one I saw today, that Logan that sold for 950 bucks, you can't even get anything comparable for 10 times that. So it's kind of crazy, but cool stuff. Um, I've shot little clips on my South Bend that I have, and I think I paid like 1100 bucks for it off Craigslist or OfferUp or something like that. And when I went and saw it, I was like, this thing is 80 years old and it's hardly been used. You can just look at certain things and know that it hasn't been worn out because they can be really worn out. So you gotta be really careful and know what you're looking for. Like I said, don't just go buy one on a whim. Make sure you know what you're looking at. That was a long answer because I just had that whole thing where I was so tempted to buy that lathe today or at least bid on it. Now I'm regretting not bidding on it. Anyway, anything else? Springs, you can generally use any smaller rollerball spring. Uh, there are large rollerball springs. You don't want to use those. So if you go to Turner's Warehouse, look for small rollerball. That's the size you want. Uh, they're generally like a junior. So if you've made any junior pen kits, they're about that size. So if you have those laying around, you can certainly use them. Uh, but they're going to give you that size that I showed that just like maybe a half inch compression. And you just want a little bit of pressure. You don't want it to be super tight or super loose. You just want it like snug from the spring pressure I'm talking. Do we have a um, estimated time for the ten cutters? Um, do we have an estimated time for the tenon cutters? We are currently making them. The problem is they, we make all the parts in like groups of like 50 or 100. So I can't just make like one whole unit at a time. I have to make all of the parts in a row. So I won't have any ready till they're all done, but we're probably looking at five, six weeks total to get them all done and I know that's a long time but just hang on it's totally worth it I promise and we'll have them done in the meantime we will work on getting mandrels out and those we can release you know a few at a time whatever we get done but the tenon cutters because they're all CNC machined we have to do the whole batch of each size part so there won't be any singles done at once they are made in America they're made right here in Arizona so um, you know you're getting locally made stuff and I hope that matters to everybody it certainly matters to us <laughs> and you're making an American pen so that's good good stuff I kind of glossed over this let's real quick um, so this was the other one but that's our section it kind of looks cool you know really it's totally preference um, as long as your cap goes on and you know closes for you that's really perfect um, it is a little blunt, but it writes fine. And I'll tell you, rollerball is very nice. So I'll probably actually carry this pen around because I don't like to mess with a fountain every day, but I do like a rollerball, so I'll probably use this one. Um, there's an extra section too, so it's nice. Any other questions there, Amy? Hopefully you guys see that that's not very complicated. I don't know how long we've been live. How long have we been on? Like, was that 45 minutes maybe? I don't know how long we've been here, but that didn't take very long and I talked the whole time. So if you make it without talking, you could probably make one of those in 20 minutes, half an hour. <laughs> but obviously we stop and talk a lot and it helps, hopefully. Hopefully it helps. Um, John was wondering about who's done this in clips yet. So that's a good way to talk about it. Oh yeah. John asked if we've done, any, if we've done anything on clips yet. So. Uh, programming note, Clips is our next live stream. However, our next live stream will not be next week. Next week will be a video at three o'clock, but Amy and I will be on the road to the Blade Show, uh, so we won't be able to do a live. But that is coming, that'll be our next live stream as soon as we get back, but we will have a video in the meantime. So please check that out next week to keep, keep your memory to come back to three o'clock. Um, give us a thumbs up on it so we know you're here and whatever. But we will have a cool couple of videos coming off of our trip because we're going to meet up with some turners and makers along the way. And I'll probably do a little bit of uh, showing off some cool stuff at Blade if anyone's interested. So that might be on Instagram or something. I don't know. We'll see. But next week there will be a video, but the clips are coming on the next live stream, which will be a couple weeks. Yep. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Please give it us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, all that jazz. 
If you haven't watched the other videos, go check those out and you can always reference them. Uh, don't forget, we are running the ornament contest to raise money for St. Jude. And this is a record power regent, but we have a record power herald, which we have in our classroom right over there. Uh, and we are giving a new herald away to someone that enters the contest. It'll be a random drawing for everyone that enters the contest. What? Oh, plus Easywood Tools. We just got word. Easywood Tools is giving a set of tools for every category. So if you win a category, you're going to win a full set of tools for that, that category. So like last year, I think like the wood category got a set of minis and the hollow got a set of hollow form tools. Awesome prize. Worth, worth a lot of money. Worth entering because remember, it's all for charity and if you can win a prize while doing a cool charity thing, that's pretty awesome. So we've got a lot of awesome um, vendors that are stepping up with prizes. We'll do some more videos on that. I don't want to take everybody's time here, but thank the vendors when you see them uh, because those guys really do put up money year after year and prizes year after year. So it's super cool. All right. I think that's all I got unless there's any other final questions. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hey, make something next week since we're not live. Listen to the video that we post and watch, maybe make a kit list or something or a custom. Everybody good? Everybody's good. All right. Great demo. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Awesome. Thank you. Over and out. Later, Zach.